Chapter 80, The Nut. If the sperm whale be physiognomically a sphinx, to the phrenologist his brain seems that geometrical circle which it is impossible to square. In the full-grown creature, the skull will measure at least 20 feet in length. Unhinge the jaw, the lower jaw, and the side view of this skull is as the side of a moderately inclined plane resting throughout on a level base. But in life, as we have elsewhere seen, this inclined plane is angularly filled up and almost squared by the enormous superincumbent mass of the junk and sperm. At the high end, the skull forms a crater to bed that part of the mass, while under the long floor of this crater, in another cavity seldom exceeding 10 inches in length and as many in depth, reposes the mere handful of this monster's brain. The brain is at least 20 feet from his apparent forehead in life. It is hidden away behind its vast outworks, like the innermost citadel within the amplified fortifications of Quebec. So like a choice casket, it is secreted in him that I have known some whalemen who peremptorily deny that the sperm whale has any other brain than that palpable semblance of one formed by the cubic yards of his sperm magazine. Lying in strange folds, courses, and convolutions to, to their apprehensions, it seems more in keeping with the idea of his general might to regard that mystic part of him as the seat of his intelligence. It is plain, then, that phrenologically, the head of this leviathan in the creature's living intact state is an entire delusion. As for his true brain, you can see you can then see no indications of it nor feel any. The whale, like all things that are mighty, wears a false brow to the common world. If you unload his skull of its spermy heaps and then take a rear view of its rear end, which is the high end, you will be struck by its resemblance to the human skull, be, be held in the same situation and from the same point of view. Indeed, place this reversed skull scaled down to the human magnitude among a plate of men's skulls, and you would involuntarily confound it with them, and remarking the depressions on one part of its summit, in phrenological phrase, you would say, this man had no self-esteem and no veneration. And by those negations, considered along with the affirmative fact of his prodigious bulk and power, you can best form to yourself the truest, though not the most exhilarating conception of what the most exultant potency is. But if from the comparative dimensions of the whale's proper brain you deem it incapable of being adequately charted, then I have another idea for you. If you attentively regard almost any quadruped's, quadruped's spine, you'll be struck with the resemblance of its vertebrae to a strong necklace of dwarfed skulls, all bearing rudimental resemblance to the skull proper. It is a German conceit that the vertebrae are absolutely undeveloped skulls, but the curious external resemblance, I take it the Germans were not the first men to perceive. A foreign friend once pointed it out to me in the skeleton of a foe he had slain, and with the vertebrae of which he was inlaying, in a sort of basso relievo, the beaked prow of his canoe. Now, I consider that the phrenologists have omitted an important thing in not pushing their investigations from the cerebellum through the spinal can canal, for I believe that much of a man's character will be found betokened in his backbone. I would rather feel your spine than your skull, whoever you are. A thin joist of a spine never yet upheld a full and noble soul. I rejoice in my spine, as in the firm, audacious staff of that flag which I fling half out to the world. Apply this spinal branch of phrenology to the sperm whale. His cranial cavity is continuous with the first neck vertebrae, and in that vertebra, the bottom of the spinal column will measure 10 inches across, being 8 in height and of a triangular figure, with the base downwards. As it passes through the remaining vertebrae, the canal tapers in size, but for a considerable distance remains of large capacity. Now, of course, this canal is filled with much the same strangely fibrous substance, the spinal cord, 
as the brain and directly communicates with the brain. And what is still more, for many feet after emerging from the brain's cavity, the spinal cord remains of an undecreasing girth, almost equal to that of the brain. Under all these circumstances, would it be unreasonable to survey and map out the whale's spine phrenologically? For viewed in this light, the wonderful comparative smallness of his brain proper is more than compensated by the wonderful comparative magnitude of his spinal cord. But leaving this hint to operate as it may with the phrenologists, I would merely assume the spinal theory for a moment in reference to the sperm whale's hump. This august hump, if I mistake not, rises over one of the larger vertebrae and is therefore in some sort the outer convex mold of it. From its relative situation then, I should call this high hump the organ of firmness or indomitableness in the sperm whale. And that the great monster is indomitable, you will yet have reason to know.